My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Okay, so let's take a little sample of the courses offered by Crucial Knowledge. Then you'll at least have an idea of what you're going to get. Let's start with the Human Factors series, which is targeted specifically to the aviation maintenance realm. This series includes an introduction to human factors, the Dirty Dozen, combating complacency, case studies, and safety management systems, also known as organizational factors, plus professionalism and integrity in the aviation realm. These classes meet the maintenance annex guidance from EASA and the FAA. All Crucial Knowledge courses take about an hour, and they all end with a quiz. And the results of the quizzes are quickly emailed to your inbox, giving you proof of training for employee records and to support your compliance with FAA and regulatory requirements. Let the tasting begin! It seems like you can't talk to a vendor or an FAA inspector, pick up a magazine, or attend a conference without hearing about human factors. Where did this big push for human factors come from? Well, the history of human factors training for maintenance personnel doesn't go back very far. While pilots have had the benefit of cockpit resource management, now called crew resource management, or CRM, for more than 20 years, it's only since the early 90s that human factors training has been emphasized for aircraft maintenance workers. Most people and businesses want to learn about human factors to be compliant with FAA requirements. Well, the FAA currently does not have state requirements, although it is likely they will have formal written requirements in the not-too-distant future. Until then, the FAA has published an operator's manual for human factors in aviation maintenance and outlined human factors topics that repair stations should know and understand. This video will look at these topics by examining and explaining common human factors concepts and tools as they apply to the aviation maintenance realm. Topics include the shell model, Boeing's maintenance error decision aid, usually called the meat of process, Heinrich's ratio, which is commonly referred to as the iceberg model, the reason model, describing active and latent errors, the chain of events, also known as the domino theory, or one thing leads to another, the dirty dozen, and other human factors concepts. That was a snippet, just a snippet, of the Human Factors Introduction course. Now let's look at just a portion of the Dirty Dozen course. In 1993, Transport Canada hired Gordon DuPont as a Special Programs Coordinator to develop a Human Factors workshop called Human Performance and Maintenance Part 1. From that program came the Dirty Dozen, 12 factors seen as the greatest contributors to human error in aircraft maintenance. It's important to know the Dirty Dozen, know how to recognize the symptoms, and know the safety nets or ways to avoid or contain errors spawned by the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen is typically realized when an out-of-balance condition exists. There's either too much or not enough of a thing, like too much pressure or too much stress, but not enough communication and not enough resources. Three of the Dirty Dozen are the dirtiest, and those are pressure, stress, and fatigue. These three factors usually aggravate the other factors. These dirtiest of the dirty dozen interact with the physical, emotional, and psychological aspects of humans, accelerating and complicating circumstances that can lead to maintenance errors. Here's all 12, in no particular order. Lack of communications. Complacency. Lack of knowledge. Distraction. Lack of teamwork. Fatigue. Lack of parts. Pressure. Lack of assertiveness. Stress. Lack of awareness. And norms. Let's take a closer look at each of the dirty dozen of human factors. For the purposes of this sampler, we will only look at one of the dirty dozen. Mm. 
Too much, too much, too much, too much, too much, too much. Too much. Few industries have more constant pressure to see a task completed. The secret is the ability to recognize when this pressure becomes excessive or unrealistic. There can be pressure from many angles. Pressure to get to the gate. Scheduled deadlines that are too tight. Flat rake work orders that should have been time-based. Too many projects, too little time. Hovering customers. Irate management. Pilot egos. And here comes that nitpicky know-it-all, the punk inspector. Stop. Assess the situation. Look at your work rationally. Can it be done safely in a time allotted and with the tools and parts available? If not, forcefully and clearly voice your concerns. Imagine what's the worst that could happen. What are the safety nets for pressure? Be sure pressure isn't self-induced. Communicate your concerns. Ask for extra help. Just say no. That was a little Barbie-sized sample of our training course on the Dirty Dozen. Next is a small snippet of our course on complacency. We join this class midway. Let's take a quick look at a simplified depiction of mental functioning, a blueprint of how our minds work at a task, including input, filtering, and function. First, there are many competing inputs. Noise, lighting, distractions, sounds, other people, information, smells, temperature, and so on. These inputs are things that are in our immediate environment. We know them through our senses. Next is how we attempt to filter all those inputs so that we use only the information we need to achieve our desired task. This filter is our attention, and it has two interactive parts. One is our conscious workspace, the here and now where we break down selected data. The conscious workspace can cause us to take direct actions, moving our hands and feet, directing our eyes, or perhaps prompting us to speak. But the conscious workspace also has constant back and forth interaction with our long-term memory or knowledge base. This is where we have stored all our past experiences, and some of them may relate to or inform the current conscious workspace. An important difference between the conscious workspace and long-term memory is that the capacity of the conscious workspace is severely limited. When you look up a phone number and keep it in mind until you dial it, you're using the conscious workspace. But the conscious workspace has a time span of less than two seconds One Mississippi, two Mississippi. before it needs to be refreshed as new bits of information or thoughts displace older items of information. Think of it as a leaky bucket. Okay, you're a skilled professional and you no doubt know your colors, right? You probably learned your colors in kindergarten or even before that. So let's test your ability to do a simple task based on the mental blueprint. I can't do anything about distractions you may have around you right now because, hey, I'm stuck in cyberspace. So let that be your concern. And you're also responsible for your long-term knowledge, which I'm pretty confident includes an awareness of colors. Here's your conscious workspace, and in just a minute, I'm going to display some words that are printed in various different colors. Your job is to say the color out loud that each word is written in. Don't say the word, say the color of the word and say it out loud. You'll have 15 seconds and there are 15 words. And remember, if you don't say the color out loud, you're cheating and we grade on the curve. Ready? Go. Not so easy, huh? Your long-term memory and the habits you've learned in reading are what made it difficult for you to work in this conscious workspace. Be careful driving home. It's red at the top, yellow in the middle, green on the bottom. So there's a smidge of our complacency course. And our next one in the Human Factors group is case studies. This one's slightly different than the others in that it has essay questions at the end. This is Sean's story. 
I've been assigned to do an A-check on the number one engine of an A320. I've done that a lot. It's no biggie. I follow the job car procedures, which requires deactivation of the hydraulic thrust reverser using a safety pin in the control unit. Working through the job card and making the inspection, I found a few discrepancies that had to be worked. Minor things, really. But it took some time, and I had to go to the manuals and search for more information. As time passed, it was coming up on time for push-out, and I still had to run up the engines for leak checks. So about then is when I became rushed and missed reactivating the thrust reverser hydraulic control unit. I didn't realize my mistake until I was in my car on the way home, and the aircraft was already airborne. Of course, I immediately called the station manager on my cell and explained the problem. He said he'd contact the tower and do what he could to notify the pilot. I went home, but I sure did not feel good about things. Well, I learned the next day that the aircraft had landed safely at its destination, but the number one thrust reverser didn't deploy, and the crew said they'd had a hard time stopping the plane, but they didn't overshoot or anything. What I learned is that, obviously, I need to pay more attention to my work and try to avoid situations where I feel rushed. Still, it would have been helpful if there had been a remove before flight streamer on the deactivation pin. I would have seen that when I was closing the fan cowl. Also, the job card doesn't say remove the pin as part of the process. It only says restore the aircraft to normal, and it doesn't have a line item to do an operational check of the thrust reversers. Maybe you could blame Sean for leaving the lockout pin in the thrust reverser, but there seems to have been other contributing factors. Look through the list of the dirty dozen, shown at the right, and select at least three of those you believe are relevant to Sean's mistake. Explain how they are relevant and important. Write as much as you like, and when you are satisfied with your answers, click the Submit button. And here's a brief look at safety management systems organizational factors. Following the emphasis on technology improvements came the emphasis on individual human factors. But have you ever thought about how the rationale in human factors could also apply to groups of people, an organization? How you and your coworkers are essentially a large and complex group that acts with its own group dynamic, its own personality. A collection of people mimics the traits of the individuals that make up the group. The Federal Aviation Administration, the European Aviation Safety Agency, Air Canada and aviation regulators in other countries either have adopted or will be adopting regulations requiring aviation service providers, airports and airlines to have safety management systems. In the U.S., the FAA has issued Advisory Circular 120-92A, which describes the FAA's expectations for safety management systems. The Advisory Circular is not much fun to read and most of it is the concern of management, but some aspects will fall on everyone within a company, from the janitor and security guard to the top dog. In case you're ever on a game show, we want you to know something about safety management systems, and we'll also acquaint you with how it might affect your day-to-day -day work responsibilities. First off, safety management systems are usually pictured as a little building with four columns. The columns are called pillars, and these pillars are the basic structure of any safety management system. The pillars are policy, safety risk management, safety assurance, and promotion. And here's another in the Human Factors series. Professionalism and integrity. Necessary traits for people in positions of trust. And like any position in a high-risk industry, many people are relying on you, not just your friends and family, not just your immediate employer, but also the population at large and the people who are transported by the aircraft you work on. In the 1950s, much of the U.S. workforce was comprised of unskilled labor, with technical and professional jobs making up only about a quarter of the workforce. Today, more than three-quarters of our workforce is considered professional and technical, and the need to convey that professionalism has never been greater. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a good list. 
Now you've had a taste of our Human Factors online courses, which we also teach nationwide in person if you should choose to have us visit. We also offer similar courses in other aviation maintenance realms. Safety management system implementation. Boeing Standard 5117. Aircraft electrical bonding. AS-9100. Internal auditor training. AS-9100. Ref C. And AS-9101. Ref D. The checklist. Geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Electrical wiring inspection. The Boeing Standard BAC-5000. Adhesives and sealants. The Boeing Standard BAC-5009. Fesners and torque. ISO 17025. Auditing and test and calibration labs. Remember to check the latches. Aircraft tires and wheels. Owner performed maintenance. Eight hours of inspection authorization renewal. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time getting acquainted with us. And please, keep up your vigilance.